Welcome to the Celtic Whiskey Pod. I'm your host, Al Higgins, and in episode three, we speak to Graham Cool, the master distiller at Dingle Distillery. Graham is a vastly experienced whiskey maker who's learned his trade in high profile Scottish distilleries such as Glenfiddich, Balvenie, and Glen Murray. In 2019, he made the big move to Ireland where he was chosen to head operations at Dingle Distillery in County Kerry. In our conversation, we talk about the challenges in changing from making Scottish malt whiskey to the unique styles made at Dingle, the future of the distillery, experiments with peated malt, double distillation, and even rum. I'm joined by Julie Christie, our head of marketing. She is yet another blow in from Scotland, but she now lives in the Kingdom of Kerry, not far from Dingle. So I can only apologise in advance for having three Scottish people talking in depth about Irish whiskey here. There's plenty more to listen out for in our conversation. We hope you enjoy it. And if you do, please remember to like and subscribe. You're listening to the Celtic Whiskey Pod, the home of unchill filtered conversation. Graham Cool from Dingle Distillery. You're yeah, very welcome to join us on the Celtic Whiskey Pod. Thank you for joining the conversation. I'm Al Higgins. Mm-hmm. I'm joined by Julie Christie. And, uh, hey guys. Hello. So, Graham, um, you might maybe start by telling us uh, what got you into whiskey and how your career progressed and how you ended up in Dingle. Yeah, yeah. It's been a, been a bit of a journey, obviously, in terms of time and distance as well. But, uh, yeah, whiskey for me started back in 1994, so a long, long time ago. Uh, my first role in whiskey was actually on in the bottling side at uh, Glenfiddich at Duffdown, where they bottled all their 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 Glenfiddich at that time. That that, that the distillery, which was uh, quite quite unique, and so that got me the the foothold in the door. Um, the reason I managed to get the job at Glenfiddich was prior to that my uh, first job after leaving university was uh, in a brewery in Halifax doing a graduate trainee program where I picked up the knowledge of brewing and and also the bottling and packaging side of things so so it was the bottling experience that got me into to Glenfiddich in the first place. What was your background at university was that related to sort of brewing? Uh, well it, it, it helped you know I studied chemistry so Right. Yeah, it, it gave me a broad ground, uh, grounding to to waffle about all things chemistry. Yeah, <laughs> <And> me, <laughs> every, everybody thinks you're pretty knowledgeable, but really, uh, I think it's like any degree you study what you need to study, and then it, within a year or two you forget the whole thing. <laughs> T- tell tell me about that. I'm actually studying um, the stilling diploma at the moment, and yeah, I've forgotten the first two years already. Uh, uh, yeah, there, there is so much knowledge that you, you have to soak up for these things and it really is, it's off the scale when you get into the nitty gritty of, of actually working in the industry. It doesn't matter what it is, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the stuff they don't teach you that you need to learn pretty quick. Uh, and it's all just first world problems really um, uh, that you deal with. But yeah, so, so yeah, that was my start. Um, I, when I was at Glenfiddich then, uh, I got the opportunity to move across to the to production, the process side of things, and it being a very big site, there's obviously Glenfiddich, Balvenie, and Canenvy yeah. distilleries on the same site. So, so the process side, the, the distillation side, was was looked after, you know, in its in isolation. Um, and I started in Glenfiddich process, and then I inherited the Balvenie and Canenvy. Uh, distilleries as well and the, the four maltings at Balvenie so, so wow the, 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 a big you know a, a good grounding in, in in all things distilling really Definitely. yeah it sounds like the the perfect job for uh you know moving on and learning the craft it, it, yeah it let me it, it, sorry, it taught me a, it taught me a lot and it was also more interesting this was back in early well 2000 2001 when it's probably the, the last downturn in, in distillery production that that, uh, that I remember. Um, back then, you really had peaks and troughs of, of production where, where you'd have boom and bust. Uh, those, thankfully, those don't seem to happen anymore. But uh, so back then, uh, basically, Glenfiddich was on thirty percent production. Um, so wow. I, had to, I had to ramp Glenfiddich down. Uh, Balvenie stayed around 100% production, <laughs> and, and Canenvy went basically from uh, 100% to zero. So, wow! I, it, 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 
it's it's harder to run distilleries that are stop start yeah than, than it is to run something that's 24 7. that's incredible to hear that glenn Fiddick would be cut back that amount when it's such a big brand you know and uh everyone thinks you know glenn Fiddick like sells worldwide but um the fact that he had to cut back production says a lot it does yeah, yeah. it's just it's just stock situations you know the stock situation was very very high and uh, it, but you know since then obviously probably glenn Fiddick has never taken the foot off the pedal and you know they've expanded again i believe so yeah and they're doing some interesting things at can envy now as well mm. um it's kind of like a a test bed almost but um commercial test bed because they're they're doing all these innovating sort of distillations and um selling them to people as well which is quite a, quite interesting yeah yeah can it be, can it, if anybody's ever been there can it be, is just a shed you know um, yeah. if you think Ding, if you think dingles are shed then then can it be is probably a, a similar, similar <laughs> architecture i would say uh there wasn't too much uh, budget spent on the on the fabric of the building but uh, <laughs> That, you know that doesn't matter. It's it's it's, it's the distillation and the, and the stills that count. And yeah. so so yeah, I, I ran Canvi on and off um, uh, when I was there, but it was uh, definitely more off than on. Uh, and we had the floor floor maltings as well, which was another uh, interesting thing. But basically, it was great because we, we managed to keep everybody in jobs. That that was the thing back then. Uh, I had a, a score a crew of probably twenty twenty to twenty five process operators there and yeah they had to maybe uh, take a, uh, a dip in the number of shifts they work per year but but, uh, but we got through those tricky yeah. kind of two or three years everybody uh, stayed in production and then uh, since then it, it, it's taken off yeah it's probably quite similar to the climate that we're in at the moment as well you know it's kind of one of these times where you're just kind of expected to kind of develop with the challenge really it is and i think it's probably the tail end of the business that's that's obviously feeling it just now in, in all ways you know the uh, the first impact and everybody saw i think last year was that the sales disappeared for a while um, yeah and uh, you know so there's some real short-term pain there to to get over and then you know, I don't think I don't think anybody's sales are back to where they where they were, especially if you you relied on selling on trade and off. You know, so uh, you, you we're, we're in a, a new world. But yeah, I, I think probably people in production have, have had the easiest ride through all of this because whiskey production doesn't doesn't connect Stop, yeah. with the real world at that time. It connects with the world five ten years on. Yeah, or even so, further, even like 20 years ahead. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, hopefully not. You know, I spoke about boom and bust. Really, I don't wouldn't like to see that. But, but you know, one impact of COVID could could be, you know, a dip in production maybe in in three, four or five years when when there's maybe, you know, a, a glut of stock and, and you know, people need to take the foot off the pedal to to, to balance it all out. But, to, that that's unfortunately the way the way it is but uh, we might talk a bit more about that later on um on mm -hmm. the sort of current situation and is there a whiskey lock is there too much production but um maybe talk now about how you move from glenfiddich balvenie to glen murray and uh mm -hmm. what, what was the reason for that move yeah so it spent you know probably in the Process side at Glenfiddich, Balvenie, I was there for four ish, four or five years. And, uh, you know, so definitely got a, a good grounding there. Um, looking at where I was going to go next, it was really either widen my experience or possibly go into, if I stayed within the William Grants group, probably my next logical move would have been to into grain distilling, which yeah, uh, I still don't understand grain distilling much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it takes a certain breed of person to work in grain, but uh, I'll probably get I don't think so. it's not really exciting, is it? <laughs> well, I, I don't know, you, can't, you can't see it, you can't smell it too much. Well, you see it, but uh, yeah, it's it's a different beast and on a different scale as well. Especially yeah. grain in Scotland is 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 is, is massive, you know. So you, so you, you kind of get. Uh, you, 
to, you lose kind of connection with the with the process. So yeah, anyway, that was my decision making process. Um, also, the the grain distilling in William Grant's is based in Gervin, which is if anybody's been to Gervin, yeah. <laughs> that's it's not, not the most exciting. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> bit of a ghost town. Yeah, yeah. So so anyway, the the opportunity came to. Um, take on the distillery manager role at Glen Murray in 2005 and luckily I was taken on in that role and I spent um, how long, 14 years, forgetting the numbers now, uh, 14 years at, at Glen Murray and, and it was good, good, again, everything you do is, is always good experience, good or bad, but you know, from a Glen Murray point of view, I saw the distillery expand from from a capacity of two million liters up to six million liters in the time wow. I was there, wow. uh, so that, that, that's again great experience for me for for uh, you know putting in or putting in additional capacity to an existing distillery is trickier than build well definitely trickier than building a new one uh, in many ways. So again, uh, good grinding and that. I'm not an engineer; would never claim to be an engineer, but. Unfortunately, you do have to get into some of that nitty gritty when, yeah. when your expansion, your production goes up by three times. So, uh, so that was that was good. And also, Glen Murray itself changed ownership in that time. Uh, it was purchased by uh, La Martinique as a French group, purchased from the Glenmorangie Company. So, so they did their bit as well to to promote Glen Murray and increase the the range and the the reach of Glen Murray as well. So, so. It was good fun developing the the brand, the, the whiskies, and you know, bringing the distillery forward into uh, one of the bigger distilleries in Speyside. Now it must be, you know. Uh, yeah, it's quite an important uh, distillery for them, really, isn't it? Because they they do a lot of blended whiskey in in France, which I assume it goes into. But then also being one of the malt whiskey distilleries that that seems to be coming through, you know, and, and it's more in people's minds now thanks to a few different wood finishes and things like that. Yeah, yeah, Glen Murray's, uh, you know, it, it was always a workhorse distillery, a blending uh, malt, really, a uh, bit similar to Balvenie, if you go back, wind back the clock. So in the Glen Morangy ownership days, probably half to three quarters of the spirit was used for blending um, or cash sales, bulk cash sales. Yeah. When Lamartini, Kez took over, the the selling of whiskey uh, stopped. We still did the reciprocal trading for, for blending because that was important. Um, but the, they also needed to produce enough single malt for, for their uh, their blends. And obviously the label five is their main blend and it's in the you know in the top ten Scotch whiskey. So so that was the reason for the increased capacity. So when we got to six million liters capacity, roughly one to one and a half million of that was for Glen, Glen Murray single malt, and then the, the remainder was for for blends. So you can see where their where the, where the volume was was going. Yeah, definitely. And then what would you say? Why Dingle? Like what? Why the next steps to to Dingle Distillery, and why move over from Scotland to Ireland? Well, probably you know. Having done all that at Glen Murray, you, you you do reach points in your your working lives where you where you assess where you are and what you want to do, um, and uh, a lot of it depends on your circumstances, your your age. But uh, you know, I've probably got about another 10, 15 years uh, working, hopefully, in whiskey industry. So uh, yes, I could have seen that out at Glen Murray and quite happily and and uh, walked off into the sunset, but. The whisky industry, certainly from a production point of view, is booming just now. Yeah, and there's so many opportunities, and you know, you you do get contacted, you know, on a regular basis, uh, being offered things or being asked if you're interested in this, that, or the other. So, uh, when the Dingle the opportunity came along, there's just I don't know, just something that clicked with the whole thing. Uh, I just really liked where where Dingle was at as a distillery in terms of its development and you know I just felt that yeah I could really uh, come to Dingle and, and help and, and and make you know put my put my mark on Dingle and, and bring it from what was well uh, sort of a seven-year-old distillery to let's say a 20-year-old distillery 
and uh, a full range of whiskies, hopefully. Yeah. And had you you tried the whiskey before you decided to take the job? <laughs> Only <laughs> just, you know. <laughs> Irish whiskies, uh, I don't know, it's probably really on the last couple of years that it's start to take off or being more recognized at least i think you know yeah. pot still was something very foreign to me i if you said to me you'd pot still whiskey i just assumed that was made in a pot still and that was it you know because it's a term used in, in scotland uh, as well but uh, so that, so yeah you know uh, it was a pretty quick learning curve to as to what's what's out or what, what is irish whiskey um, and it's yeah. all the more confusing with the you know the sourced material and who releases what. So you you've got you've got a real net uh, sort of network to work out there as to where everything's coming from and who does what. So yeah, and then you've got the the whole processing and the whole production methods to, I suppose, relearn. Was there a, a sort of period of getting to grips with triple distillation and how to how to brew a, a pot still mash bill? Yeah, yeah, there is a bit. You know, you need to you need to know the the intricacies of it all, and yeah, you know, Dingle is an established facility in terms of its production. So you're not you're not coming over to to change things dramatically. You you truly really just to get get your own head around it and see you know right what makes Dingle Dingle and what what do we need to look after in the future. The main thing really was starting to try and widen the the uh, sort of cask choice that we were using. Right. Dingle yeah. very strongly used, you know, bourbon casks and sherry casks uh, mainly and, and and some port. So there's a good healthy stock of maturing whiskey, but uh, you know, not not a great deal of variety out with that. There's some small pockets of other cask types in there. So so the first thing I really have been working on in the first couple of years is to to just uh, expand our options. It's, you know, it's obviously it's different in Ireland. You have a few more options in terms of what wood you can use. Would part of that consideration include wood types other than oak? So, you know, you have other people using acacia, cherry, chestnut. Would they be in, in some of those plans? It, it, it would be. It's not something I've dabbled in much or with really, uh, to be honest. I tend to find some of these things very niche products, I think. I think we, we use oak because oak oak works, you know. Uh, yeah. It's nice yeah. to do yeah. the other things, but they'll they'll never become the norm and you know, some some work and some don't. So it's nice to experiment, but you do need to kind of hold on to what is what is dingle and what, what you, know, you you can't just play around all the time and experiment. Um you know, we we are uh, you know, hopefully a distillery that will like, expand our sales and, and our reach. So you do need to have some kind of consistency of approach to to offer people, uh, but also have the, the variety there that to appeal to those that are looking for something different every time. Yeah. And um, those new casts as well, you, you've done some Scottish style peated malt. And uh, am I right in that you've done some double distillation with that as well? Yeah, yeah. I introduced some peated spirit last year, and we're just yeah. running it uh, just now as well. So I made the choice there to to double distill that because my feeling is that you know if we want to do a peated whiskey, we, the the triple distillation we might just lose too much of it. Um, hopefully, in the future, we'll we'll do some. We'll we'll try some triple as well. But I didn't in the first instance. I didn't want to just bring. You know, a load of peated malted barley in, and then get very little uh, bang for a buck at the end of it in terms of peat. So, yeah. so yeah, double distillation. But double distillation works at Dingle because the we have the three stills, but the wash still and the spirit still are are uh, perfect sizes for for double. So you know, we can jump over to double distillation very very quickly and and back again. Yeah. Um, so. Is there any sort of like different types of like wood finishes that you can see working really well with the dingle spirit that might not have already been tried? I think, you know, there's not not a lot of wine casks being used at dingle. Uh, we have a little bit of rum as well. So, I'm, you know, I'm learning. I don't know. The, the, the thing about the dingle and, and all the young Irish whiskey distilleries is 
we don't know what the whiskey is like going to be like at 12 years old so we're it's it's a bit of a journey and a bit of a, a trial and error almost yeah. yeah yeah you don't you don't know but I'm of a feeling if you if you make good spirit good new make spirit then pretty much it, most cast types will work but they may not be ever be cup of tea or flavor yeah. but but they will you know they'll be balanced the main thing is trying to get a balance and not overcook the whiskey in the cask yeah uh, and and try and retain at least some of the the, the the kind of core spirit character there because whiskey. that's obviously come through in the early releases anyway you know that i think the the first few releases everyone was very impressed with the actual spirit character because obviously that's mostly what you're tasting with a, a young whiskey but also i mean the quality of the casts at the moment is probably pretty high because they're predominantly first fill anyway aren't they yeah, everything's everything's first fill. You know, we yeah. are obviously back filling now. Uh, anything we empty, we're filling second fill. But uh, our policy going forward is that we will not third fill casks. So, uh, and you know, and I will retain the second fills, which is a you know, second fill casks are, are very very good. That they will be kept for sort of twelve years and older. And so I'll be so down for work. some. Uh, I'll be down for some planters for my garden in about six years' time. Then <laughs> yeah. selling them off cheap. That that is the problem. If you if you have a tight policy like that, you do have to offload casks. Yeah, uh, which you know are, are do have a worth. But hopefully, as Irish whiskey industry grows, there'll be we will be able to 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 offload them. And you know you know there's nothing particularly wrong with a third fill cask. It has its it has its use, but you need you know you need a decent amount of first and seconds to go with it but our our thought process is to stick with the first and seconds because that's what people know that's what people know with dingle it's been first fill casks all the way and and quite a high percentage of sherry so we will you know we'll maintain that and you know where we are moving towards uh, more of what we would call a core expression dingle which will be available all yeah. the time what know, was the batch. What was the first bottling you put together? Was that the batch five single malt, or was it, it previous? Yeah, it would have been. I, I had a little bit of a hand in pot still three before uh, before I arrived, but really, batch five single malt was the the first one that I took yeah. from from start to to finish. So that was that was that was good. It's always nice to to create the whiskey and, because it, again, it. it, it it, uh, you have to know your stock then, so you know you need a decent sampling regime before you you jump in and, and come in with the final final mix, really. And could you tell us, obviously, at the moment, um, do you also be overseeing the vodka and the gin? And would you have had like much experience with that before, or was that quite a kind of culture shock almost? Uh, yeah, no, gin and vodka wasn't. Uh, I, there's nothing that I'd kind of come across before. Um, thankfully, the, the, it's pot still gin and pot still vodka, so uh, the, the, yeah. it's the, not too different. Yeah, it's not too different. Yeah, obviously, uh, vodka is very, very straightforward. It's uh, but the, with the gin, you have the botanicals. But it's yeah, the 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 the, 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 the principles are the same. So. The gin has been a real sort of driving force, really, in these early years for the distillery, hasn't it? And it's a, a kind of a model that a lot of distilleries work on. Yeah, gin, gin was uh, excellent. You know, you, you have to count your your chickens and in, in, you know, if you've been lucky, say you've been lucky, and Dingle have been very lucky in the in the gin uh, the the gin revolution that's taken off. They were they were just got in there at the right time and. You know, have reaped to the rewards, and the great thing about that is you can then channel that that income back into the the whiskey side of things. Because yeah. whiskey's an expensive uh, game to be in. To, you could it probably put Dingle further ahead now than it would have been without, definitely without the gin. You would have yeah. uh, struggled to be to be this far on. It's been very impressive because you wouldn't necessarily expect a, a small company uh, like Dingle to to release what has become quite a, a big brand really you know in terms of the new craft gins it's, it's one of the ones that you see everywhere which is it's quite an achievement really the, the next thing like everyone's been 
saying for years and years and years, like rum is the next big spirit. And they're saying it again. Would you ever be tempted to do a little bit of rum as well? Yeah, we, we would be. Yes. Yeah, it would be it'd be interesting to do. You know, it's I've certainly looked at it and uh, may have done a few little trials on it as well. Uh, just ah. but a very <laughs> small scale. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Again, Stay tuned. Uh, <laughs> Again, I uh, yeah, watch this. Well, don't watch this space because you get bored waiting, probably. But uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I can uh, imagine that has its own challenges in terms of getting it fermented and uh, yeah, quite a, a different uh, method it, of it, production. It, yeah, ru you know, rum rum is not made in Ireland or Scotland particularly. <laughs> so, so to try and recreate the conditions of of uh, Caribbean or whatever, um, you certainly don't do that in Dingle uh, very no. easily. Well, you got the Gulf Stream, you know the palm trees. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So whatever is made, it'll, it you know you, you're not you have to make it your own product. It's it's not going to mimic anything. So yeah, yeah. We're, we're always open to uh, looking at other options, but because we you know we have the distillation equipment. As I said, the Dingle um, distillery, the equipment is is very flexible in how we can move move things and change things. Yeah. So we have the the opportunity to, to 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 do lots lots of different things. You're listening to the Celtic Whiskey Pod, the home of unchill filtered conversation. There's uh, a lot of talk. I don't know if you've been um, involved in it yourself, but about the sort of redrafting of the um, single pot still specification in Ireland, and uh, a lot of people doing uh, more diverse mash bills. Is that anything you'd be interested in, you know, including a bit of rye and oats into a single pot still recipe? Yeah, I think I think it's it's too far. It's far too tight. And uh, I think it could be resolved fairly, fairly simply. You know, if you if you stick with a sort of 30 uh, percent uh, rule, then you're 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 struggling with it. You know, if you can't use more oats and rye and also there's no scope for peated. Uh, pot still at the moment, which you know, doesn't make it, 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 it doesn't make any sense really. Uh, that would certainly be very interesting to try. Yeah, that would be really interesting. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, there you know, there's a few, uh, a few distilleries doing non uh, non pot still mash bills, which hopefully they'll, they'll become legal. I think you still need some kind of criteria because. It's a little bit too confusing to the consumer. And, yeah, I think it comes down but, to the style but, of, and the flavour, really, yeah. doesn't it? Rather than the production methods, you know, yeah. um, if it's if it's too different to the established style, then yeah, maybe it isn't really single pot still. But if it tastes like what's gone before, whether it's historic or sort of current um, bottles that are available, then yeah, it's fair enough. Yeah. No, just a bit more flexibility on the percentage of, of what you can include, and yeah. I think we're there. I, th I think we'll get there. But these things are they're protected by law and everything else, so they're not they're not easy things to to change. Yeah. And sometimes I, I think it's been left alone because it is it's, you know, it's just just a bit of a nightmare to to uh, get get the changes through. But then no, there's definitely a, a, a momentum there to to move it on now. Yeah, I think and, uh, these rules have to be changed from time to time because the, you know everything's changing, and um, different things happen. Different things become available. The, you know, there's talk in Scotland about. Um, well, did, I think did you get your knuckles wrapped over a cider cast finish? Was that a controversial um, thing at Glen Murray? Yeah, yeah, it, it pushed the limits. Well, yeah, I, can, I think we knew it pushed the limits, but. You know, there had been cider casks used before, but uh, it, yeah, it did fail. We, we we played our case. We tried to to, to argue the case, but but uh, unfortunately, it wasn't accepted. So, it seems a bit crazy to me because you know, uh, in Ireland, people are doing it and you know using cider casks, and there's you know tequila mezcal being used as well. I think in Scotland, yeah. that's kind of frowned upon at the moment, isn't it? Tequila casks. Uh, tequila is now okay. Yeah, all they're, right. They're okay. Oh, is it? Yeah, yeah. They got they got in. I can't remember what else got in at that point, but cider didn't get back in. 
Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, didn't get in, didn't get back in. It was never in there. Yeah. Someone there doesn't like you, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it, 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 the unfortunate thing is that I think it actually worked as well. You know, the actual cider cask or the cider character actually worked with the whiskey. So I think if it works, then then uh, there should be scope to, to include it. But you know, when you start using things that are very strange or very odd, then uh, you know the whole ethos behind the Irish or Scotch whiskey technical files is that the the end product must taste like whiskey. So yeah, and you, you you didn't bear that in mind, then then you shouldn't really go far wrong. Yeah. yeah, and of course we've seen a change with the, the Japanese legislation now as well. So, um, as you were saying, like there definitely is a lot of space for for growth there. Obviously, within remits as well, like you don't want anyone, you know, pushing it too far. And as you said, not really tasting like whiskey anymore. Um, I think like obviously from like our conversation today, like it's very clear that there's like a lot of flexibility at Dingle, but does that also kind of work the other way as their kind of production limitations you know obviously being quite a small distillery is there you know going to be the room for the expansion and the growth in that site it, yeah it's it's again that's something i've been working on in my first year or so that i've been here is you know dingle will need to expand you know, we're not we don't have a production capacity really that can can uh, you know if we want to if we want to to break into new markets, you need to have a a, a, a scale of, of production that, that can service those markets. So, so yeah, I think that definitely at some point we will need to look uh, at that. But that's where my Glen Murray experience comes in of, of adding capacity to, to existing operations. So I think, you know, within the, the current footprint, we can, we can do a, an awful lot to increase that production, but it's not never easy. You'll know where Dingle is. It's, it's on a yeah. bridge beside, between some houses. So there's all these these issues that you need to take into account. I have to say, it, it wouldn't have been the first choice I would make for a building to put a distillery in. Location is is amazing, but um, it, it's quite a, an unusual uh, shed to put a distillery in. I'd say. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, it has a water source. That's the main thing. You know, yeah. The first thing you yeah. you're going to build a distillery, find some water. And it is an and old then, mill, I suppose. So that's you know yeah. it's kind of traditional um, situation Site for the distilleries. distilleries. Yeah. What's the um, what's the main kind of limiting factor at the moment for production? Is it um, the mash tun, the washbacks, or the stills themselves? Yeah. No. The the mash tun. Um, is the limit mashed on it and the washbacks are, are are matched so yeah so with with extra mashing capacity and um fermentation capacity we could increase we're only currently operating a two shift system as well so we can add a third shift and, and go around the clock yeah. so there's these different steps that we can go to 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 get a bit more out of the the plant and then then you need to start looking that your your steam supply and all the services that go go with it, so that it, it becomes it's always the it's it's not the equipment, the distillation equipment or the washing equipment that's ever the 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 biggest issue. It's it's all the bits that feed into that. Have you got and extra make... environmental concerns as soon as you up production mm -hmm. as well? It's like what do you do with all the wastewater and everything? <laughs> yeah, it's where your your waste, your effluent goes, and your pot ale and your spent grains all these things start to become uh, bigger bigger amounts and and you know your existing routes to to offload these these products become saturated so you know and dingle's not in the middle of a in the middle of the country either it's uh, obviously at the end of the peninsula so there are limitations there does that affect your costs quite a lot uh, you know extra transport obviously but are the energy costs higher or um, um uh, yeah i think you know energy, transport costs are more you know our malted barley is, is coming from the middle of ireland so you know we're we're probably paying a little bit more on delivery but uh, it's nothing that isn't too too drastic energy wise we're on a we we're not on a gas line mains gas so 
yeah, we're we're using LPG so again. That's that's got its own premium. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, there's there's uh, definitely additional costs in, in where we're situated. Um, and obviously, like prior to Dingle, like you've worked for you know kind of big corporates in the sense of like William Grant and then at Glen Murray. What's it kind of like working for a smaller company and you know kind of family and friend run, if you like? Yeah, the, well, the strange thing is that, you know, William Grant's is family owned and, and also La Martini Kez is family owned. So so uh, I think you either have it in you to work for family owned companies or you don't, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you, 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 you have to have a, you know, it's definitely decisions can be made much more quickly. At William Grant's, even at La Martini Kez, things could be made decisions can be made very quickly you've got less people uh, uh, sort of interested in, 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 in how the business is doing so so you can you can have a longer term look as well um, no no it's I think for whiskey family owned uh, is, is definitely a benefit because the, they will tend to be able to look a bit further into distance and, and uh, look for the long term yeah from my experience, uh, family-owned companies are fine as long as you know who's in charge. That's right, and you're you're, you're never going to be part of the family, and you're yeah. never going to beat the family. So yeah, yeah, they you know they know who's the boss, and and yeah. yeah, if they if if they if they change their minds and uh, if it's their, it's their toy, so they can do that. You 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 you, you accept, but you just you, the way I look at it, I'm here to help. You know, I'm here to offer uh, options. So. The, then from there, the right decision can be made. And uh, living in Dingle, how, how do you find that compared to um, Scotland? Obviously, the, the weather's slightly better. Um, maybe it may be a little bit wetter, but nicer summers. Uh, yeah, definitely a milder climate, but uh, definitely wetter and windier. Never, uh, you know, it's uh, we, do, we do like to cycle our bikes, but to be honest, we've never had them out, out much. <laughs> because the wind is usually blowing in the wrong way. You're not going out back and forth over the Connor Pass. <laughs> I, I know. No, no. uh, but Dingle Town is this, I think everybody will think, uh, understand it's a unique town. That, uh, it blossoms in the summer, flourishes. It's, with, and it's an incredible last, place, yeah. Even last summer with the, you know, the restrictions, it still became a very, very busy town. And that gives it its own vibe and buzz. I can imagine last year being being an amazing place to visit or, or to live in because there were less tourists, but you still had all these amazing pubs and restaurants. And like, unfortunately, now we're back into another lockdown. But at the time, I'd say it was uh, pretty amazing. It, it was. It was different, you know. And and to be able to wander around the town and or take your car into town, even because I believe in the summer, you know, parking spaces are, are a premium. But uh, just that freedom to move around and it gave us a chance to to meet the locals and and you know see faces on a regular basis that we could then recognize yeah so you knew who the locals were so so it, it helped it probably did help us uh, blend in yeah and um, giving, giving us a bit of time and space you know most important yeah. question of this interview is what's your favorite pub in dingle <laughs> Controversial. <laughs> I know, I know. I am. Uh, yeah, I, I have a few. You know, I do like uh, Curran's uh, for a for a pint of Guinness. Um, obviously, Dick Max is is good. Paddy Bonds is good for watching the rugby or the sport. Uh, Hannes as well. They're all they've all got their own character. I think that's the one thing. That's they, true. Yeah, they, they've got their own bit, in, and at certain times in the day each one thrives you know you've got the, the different, yeah. you sound like a fully fledged local now oh yeah <laughs> oh definitely you could tell the time of day in dingle by who's in what pub you know and what they're drinking yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. and you know it's That's time to good. go home and dick max when certain characters turn up yeah <laughs> yeah uh, characters like peter white that's yeah. when he turns, go home. I, know, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> and I suppose, what do you think, like, to go from like a slightly different angle is, you know, like kind of Scottish perception of, of Irish whiskey? Um, I know you kind of 
touched on that a bit earlier, you know, you wouldn't have tried too, too many Irish whiskies before you came over here. Um, and, and what do you think they make of it, you know, the amount of distilleries expanding here and increasing over in Ireland? I think it's hard to take in, really, because it is, it's, you know, if you work in Scotch whisky, it's so, it's, it's so established that, you know, every, yes, yeah. there are some new distilleries, but the 80 to 90 percent of the, the distilleries are, are uh, have been around a long time. You know what they are, you know what they do. Um, whereas in Ireland, it's, it's the other way. Yeah, yeah, the volume is still being made by the big, the, you know, the, the big three or four, but uh, the the variety is going to come through from 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 all the newbies, and you you know you still you don't know what they're yeah you know, they yeah they'll have their business plans and, and they'll have their targets as to where they want to be, but uh, you know they will evolve and they will change over time. So it's 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 an ever moving uh, picture really in Ireland and you know, Dingle. Yeah. So we're we're still. Yeah, you know, we don't know our complete direction for the next ten years. We're, we can have plans, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, things can change, as we as we've well seen. It's so been I, for me. It's been hugely interesting because I I started working in Celtic whiskey in two thousand and three, and there was there was nothing happening, you know, in terms of distillery development and uh, even innovation was wasn't really happening. It was all the same brands, everything. You know, you'd get really excited if there were a couple of new releases in six months, you know, and now everything is moving yeah. so fast. But you can you can credit some of the stuff that the big companies are doing, like Irish Distillers. I think you can put the credit for that on the, the new guys driving things forward a little bit. And now the bigger companies are kind of looking over their shoulder, but they're also kind of excited at the same time. Um, and they're they're trying to sort of diversify, whilst all the little guys are doing it as well. Yeah, you need that. You need you need things you know to get to get a shuffle up or a, a, a you know the the big it's 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 easy for the, the big guys have have you know what they've done has worked. They've been very successful. So there is an argument why would you why do you change something that's that's there? But you know I saw it with Glenn Fiddick and William Grant. So they. You know, over time they reinvented Glenfiddich as a brand. You know, it was back in, you know, ten, well, twenty years ago. It was, it was just very much uh, Glenfiddich, like about twelve year old, and not much else. But now, you know, they've got lots of experimentation in there, and they, they have changed direction. So, so you do need yeah. to need to adapt. I'm actually old enough to remember when they brought out Glenfiddich, twelve year old. Before that, uh, it was Glenfiddich Pure Malt, and uh, that's right. my yeah. manager, my manager at the time in the shop was like, uh, "What were they selling us before?" <laughs> you know, yeah. it was like it was pure pure malt, but now it's like a twelve-year-old. So how old was the one yeah. before? I have no idea. Uh, yeah, uh, I was in the bottling at Glenfiddich when that when when we we put in the new bottle, and they moved. Uh, I think as well, they moved to a cork. Yeah, that used to be. A Brew cap as well. So uh, previous to that, it was uh, you know Glenfiddich dipped to as young as six years old at some point. In the wow, dim and distant yeah. past. Uh, but, uh, no, the move to twelve was 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 good. But then after that, we had the age statements disappearing off bottles. So you know, yeah, it's come full circle. Almost. Yeah, and it's all it's all consumer driven. You know, the the mm -hmm. drive for. Um, more mature or sort of age statements was kind of demand from the consumer and now mm. the consumer demands too much of that and there's not enough it's, right. that. Yeah. So it's gone round First, once again to, the age statement off and uh, regroup but I think well, again I think uh, the whiskey stocks are much healthier now and you, you will start to see age statements coming back different in Ireland because we're all you know most of us are young distilleries we're not we're not really, uh, you know, we're, we're not, we're not even at the ten-year-old yeah. mark yet. Uh, but probably uh, age things aren't now as as sought after as, as previous. You know, I think. I think transparency yeah. is is the key, really, when it comes to uh, releasing whiskies without an age statement. If you can give some indication of what 
has actually made that whiskey what it is, then the consumer is going to be happy. Um, That's right. You can have a twelve-year-old whiskey in in refill casks, which you know is is going to be not much different from the day it was born. Uh, yeah. Whereas you can have an eight-year-old whiskey in you know in first fills and or finished in something different, and and it's going to be far more developed and, and interesting. A whiskey. So, yeah, you've got to read the read the below the headlines and uh, you know, ask, as you say, transparency, ask the producer, right, what's what's in this and what, what am I drinking here, you know? Um, other than the Dingle whiskies, what what would you like to drink as a as an Irish whiskey and also what Scottish whiskies would you like to drink? Yeah, well, yeah I have no, no particular favourites because I'd probably get shot if I, if I work with them. <laughs> But I, I do like I do like trying the uh, pot stills because it is new, still new to me, and there's there is such variety in there. Yeah. Uh, so that 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 tends to uh, tend to, to interest me, and uh, you know, in terms of Scotch whiskey, uh, that's what uh, I don't know. Uh, soft spot for Klein Leash, I like uh, as, a, yeah. as a drinker. That's kind of one that I would fall back to. Uh, I used to go on my, on my holidays when I was about six years old in Brewer. So <laughs> oh, wow. the, that, I didn't drink whiskey then, but uh, you know, it's these things that uh, these memories that that you latch on to, and that's I think that's what makes your favourite whiskey come out. Uh, you must be quite excited about the prospect of Brewer being uh, reopened very soon. All right. Yeah, I am. Yes, I mean, I've hardly been back since since that that age. You know, it's not again. Yeah. Brewer is not your not your summer holiday bucket list uh, destiny. <laughs> uh, not to go swimming anyway. It was freezing. But, uh, but, but my brother in law, he works for Diageo as a project engineer, so he's he's actually overseeing the the project there. So wow. hopefully, I'll oh, get a bit yeah. of a, maybe an inside look at some point if we can ever get get back to. Yeah. Scotland. Yeah. Sure, that'll be able to, to help you with your um, jungle expansion as well, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're up in the family. <laughs> he works for Diageo. He's got a much bigger budget than, than we would ever have. <laughs> no, I was just going to touch on there, just in terms of like the, the growth of Irish whiskey at the moment, what would kind of Graham's opinion be on, you know, do you think there's kind of room for them all um, and especially like with a lot of new distilleries planned down the pipeline too. Yeah I think that to be honest on that I think we probably will all struggle to survive I think the growth has been so so big and there are so many new uh, smaller distilleries whiskey distilling does benefit from economies of scale and you know I do I do fear that that, that some might not might not make it through, you know, but that's that's business for you. Not you know, if you look at how many new start businesses survive, they 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 don't all, unfortunately. But you know, hopefully, the, no matter what happens, the the idea will will live on and the plant will live on. So that you know, even if even if the first uh, owner struggles, then somebody will will take it over and nurture it. So yeah i think we see that with the the sort of brewing um revolution in ireland where a lot of the early guys didn't last but their their equipment and their even some of their brands have uh, lived on you know beyond it all so um mm -hmm. i think it will be hard for some of the the newer small producers uh, you you guys should be all right because you've got mature enough stock i think yeah i think we're we're, uh, we're at a good place we're at the we're at the front or the head of the curve, so we're 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 not too bad that way. We need to stay there, you know, and that yeah. that, that that means you can't stand still. But but yeah, trying to <laughs> when there's well, I think we're I don't know how many distilleries we're up to now, but you know, we're in the, the around the forty mark in, in Ireland, so that's forty distilleries looking to create their own niche in in, in what is you know is a tricky market. Yeah. So you know, it's that it's not always easy, but uh, they can all make hand sanitizer yeah. if uh, things get tricky. <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> we we did, but hopefully, we'll never have to go back there again. Yeah, I was going to ask you if you're still making it, but there's probably not 
enough demand now because yeah. all the big companies have stepped up. Oh, it, it was funny, you know, everybody was scrambling around for it. And, uh, Selling yeah. at our premium as well, like, yeah. not yourselves, just I remember, like, looking online and, like, people are paying, like, 10 quid for a <laughs> tiny little <laughs> bottle of hand sanitizer. Oh, <laughs> crazy, you know, it was crazy, but uh, then the supply situation sorted itself out yeah. and, uh, you know, yeah, we, we, we still supply some locally and we... we we were dishing it out free of charge as well to to those that uh, that uh, deserved it as well. So that that's still, yeah. but yeah, I don't think uh, we're not we're we're not we're not in that game. We're not in that business. So thankfully, uh, we can leave that behind. Yeah, hopefully this time next year or even later this year, it'll all be forgotten about. Yeah, I know we need to. We need to move on. It's going to be, I think we've all lost a year in our lives or at least a yeah. year, a year and a half. Yeah. Kind of. I know, I don't know about you guys, but when <laughs> you were talking about the different pubs there, Graham, my tongue was hanging out. <laughs> <laughs> I know, just to be able to move from pub to pub and choose oh. to find and not to have a nine euro meal with it, you know. Such a luxury. Drinking pints and eating doesn't really go together. Yeah. <laughs> you know, eat substantial meals anyway. The two, you need to do one or the other. Yeah. Yeah, Graham, thank you so much. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Well, and um, next time I'm in Dingle, I'm definitely going to pop in and say hi. So thank you so much for taking part in the Celtic Whiskey Pod. Thanks, Graham. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. See you soon. Okay. You soon. Bye. Thanks again to Graham and to Dingle Distillery. I think it's fair to say their whiskey is in a very safe pair of hands and we are really looking forward to many more great releases in the future. Who knows, we may see some of that rum. If we do, I'm sure it'll be equally as good. If you enjoyed listening, then make sure to follow Graham on Twitter where he is very active and his sense of humour comes across really well. It goes without saying that Dingle Distillery is a great place to visit, so if we can travel unrestricted at any point then we would highly recommend it. As always, the best place to buy Dingle Whiskey is at www.celticwhiskeyshop.com where you will also find their award-winning gin and vodka. That's all for episode 3. Remember to like and subscribe and look out for more unchill-filtered conversation coming soon.